the captain of this DC-10 had to make a split-second decision. He was in the process of lifting his massive 200-ton jet into the air when something wasn't quite right. This morning, 21 hours after the crash, investigators found the first piece of evidence that may tell what went wrong. They found the voice recorder from the cockpit with its crucial cassette intact. When did you first notice there was something wrong with the aircraft? Part of the ceiling fell through. Yeah. You hadn't imagined that anything was wrong before then? Well, the plane was, was, a, was vibrating a lot, and I didn't know what it was from. I thought maybe that... Not, I saw the air hostess behind, getting burned, and I'm trying to open the back door. I think she did there, she was. You saw her actually uh, yeah, on fire? On fire, yeah. And she didn't get out of the aircraft? No, well, then I didn't look back again. I was so shocked. And they told me later that she died. Well, there's one missing, I suppose she's the one. 42 years later, we are going to learn about this exact moment in 1982. Looking at the decision that was made, the events that led up to it, and we'll be analyzing what investigators had to say about what went down at that critical time. So, let's look at this together. Let's discuss Spantax Flight 995. The Spanish city of Malaga sits on the southern coast right on the Mediterranean. The Spanish call this coastal region the Coast of the Sun, known as Costa del Sol. The Costa del Sol is a prime holiday destination for millions of travelers annually and has been for a long time. The entry point for holidaymakers is Malaga's International Airport, one of the busiest in Spain. Salida de Pueblo Transavia. In the 1980s, Malaga Airport was actually looking to expand to accommodate the ever-growing passenger numbers. One of the airlines that were partly responsible for this massive growth and who sought to capitalize on the booming holiday market was Canary Islands-based Spantax, which derived its name from Spanish Air Taxi. But an Air Taxi Spantax certainly wasn't. It was a leisure service air carrier that by the early 1980s were carrying millions of passengers every year becoming Spain's second largest airline behind Iberia. In spite of a string of notable accidents in the 1970s, Spantax remained a financially successful airline and in 1978 took delivery on lease their first wide-body airliner, a brand new McDonnell Douglas DC-10, registered as Echo Charlie Delta Echo Golf. The acquisition of this aircraft was means to expand their charter services across the Atlantic, which brings us to September 13th, 1982. An American tour operator had chartered this very DC-10 to transport a group of American tourists home to the United States. Spantax Flight 995 was their return trip to New York. For the accident plane though, Flight 995 wasn't its first journey of the day. In the morning of September 13th, 1982, the DC-10 was flown from Palma de Mallorca to Madrid operating a flight on behalf of Iberia. Before leaving Palma, the plane was checked. This included a quick tire pressure check on the aircraft's landing gear. Everything appeared to be normal. After arriving in Madrid, the plane became Flight 995 to New York, with an intermediate stop in Malaga. The domestic hop was only a short flight, and the DC-10 arrived in Malaga at 8.20. The sky was clear, but with a slight breeze from the south, meaning when the plane was ready to take off again, they would taxi down to the far north end of the airport for a takeoff from what was labeled at the time as runway 14. In the terminal during the turnaround, things already weren't going to plan. It was apparent that Spantax 995 to New York was overbooked. Crowds gathered at check-in and airline staff requested volunteers to stay behind. Not all of the passengers were tourists. Some were Spanish and some had come from Madrid. 381 passengers in total checked in for the flight. This actually exceeded the FEA's capacity evacuation certification for the DC-10 by just one. However, according to the accident report, one passenger was a baby. Out on the apron, the mighty DC-10 was being refueled. Ground crews loaded the tanks with all of the fuel it needed for the transatlantic trip. With a full plane to boot, every single seat in the passenger cabin filled, the aircraft was heavy. 
it would require a longer takeoff run which would utilize more of the runway length. On the flight deck, the pilots calculated their takeoff performance, taking the plane's weight and balance into consideration, as well as the condition of the runway and local weather conditions. Their performance calculations gave them a takeoff speed of 169 knots, with a flap setting of 8 degrees. 169 knots was, in this case, what the pilots called their VR. It is one of a number of notable V speeds, V1, VR, and V2 being the most important in this context. The value of these speeds change from flight to flight as a lot of variables are factored in. The weight of the plane, weather conditions, engine performance, the length of the runaway, the V speeds are never the same between flights, but are always calculated before departure from the gate, with bug markers set on the airspeed indication for reference. V1 is often thought of as a kind of point of no return checkpoint. Up until an aircraft reaches this velocity, a pilot can safely abort a takeoff with the remaining runway. Typically, once the speed is exceeded, pilots are trained to commit to the takeoff, despite what abnormalities may occur. In a modern context, you might see videos on occasion of a pilot continuing a takeoff after a bird strike, for example. Rejecting a takeoff at this point could result in a runaway overrun, which could have varying consequences on its own. I wonder what happened here. VR is the rotation speed. It's the velocity where a pilot begins to lift the nose of the plane into the air. V2 is a safety margin. It's often defined as the speed at which an airplane can safely climb away with an engine failure. These were the respective speeds as calculated by the pilots shortly before departure. When these values were calculated, they were done so with 8 degrees of flap selected for their takeoff. Investigators would later argue that, though their calculations were adequate, a flap setting of 15 degrees may have been more appropriate, as it would have lowered these speeds somewhat and made for a more efficient takeoff. Turning to the flight crew themselves, 55-year-old Captain Juan Perez had over 16,000 flight hours of experience, including over 2,000 in the DC-10. He had been flying this very aircraft for four years, pretty much since Spantax acquired it, and the other flight crew members had similar experience with the DC-10. The younger first officer was in the right seat, Juan Carlos Ramirez. At 33 years old, he had just shy of 7,000 flight hours to his name, but had roughly the same amount of time in the DC-10 as the captain. They had flown together many times. The same goes for the third member of crew, 53-year-old flight engineer Teodoro Cabejas Baruque. He too had roughly the same amount of time logged in the DC-10, around 2100 hours. When every seat was filled, the baggage loaded and the doors were closed, Spantax 995 was ready for departure. As previously stated, the DC-10 had to taxi out to the far northern end of the airport to line up on runway 14, departing to the south. By the time the plane made it to this point, the time was 9.58. Spantax 995 was immediately cleared for takeoff. The pilots pushed the throttles forward, and the massive DC-10 began to accelerate. As the speed increased, everything appeared to be normal. The engine parameters looked to all be in the green. The first officer verbally called out 80 knots to the captain as he held the plane in his hands. Shortly thereafter, 100 was called out. Still, everything looked completely normal. But. It's what they couldn't see that was outside of the normal. Unbeknownst to the flight crew, a critical failure began to rear itself under their seats. Attention should now be drawn to the DC-10's nose landing gear. The nose gear is made up of two tires, but it is tire number two on the right side that is of interest. It had recently been retreaded the previous month, in August of 1982. It had been retreaded for its third time, in fact. What would begin to occur on flight 995 was that the retread on this tire was tearing itself away. Fragments of rubber were shearing off as the plane accelerated towards the V1 speed. Those fragments would later be retrieved from the runway. Investigators would later determine the cause for this was an inadequate adhesive between the retread layers on the tire. It was also discovered that the retreading was done incorrectly. In a way, it began to experience severe breakage from the forces that come with takeoff. From the perspective of the pilots and everyone on flight 995 for that matter, 
This manifested in a heavy vibration that reverberated throughout the plane. The flight crew had no indication as to what it was. This brings us to that critical moment. Captain Perez, he doesn't know where this vibration is coming from. He's at the controls of his plane and is nearly at the V1 speed. Should he exceed that speed, he would be expected to commit to the takeoff. He looks down at his engine instruments and they appear to be showing normal levels. The engines were fine. Whatever was causing this vibration, it wasn't the engines. Given the information he had in that split second, he ultimately decided to not abort the takeoff at this time. We'll talk a little bit about why later. V1 was surpassed and the pilots were about to bring the plane into the air. Moments later, Flight 995 reached VR, the rotation speed. The captain pulled back on the control wheel and as the rotation phase progressed, he noticed the vibration only continued to get worse. Here he was met with a conflicting situation. Again, he doesn't know the source of this unusual vibration, and from his perspective, it was getting worse as the plane was angled into the air. The maximum nose up attitude was recorded to have been just over 2 degrees. Flight 995 had already passed the point he could feasibly stop the plane. The velocity of the plane was in between the VR and V2 range. It was then that the captain changed his mind. He decided to reject the takeoff. Now, let's not dance around this point. What the captain did here was against standard operating procedures, and the investigation would mention that in their accident report. However, pilots may tell you, if a pilot strongly feels that their plane would be unsafe to fly or be uncontrollable, they may elect to abort after V1 as an emergency action. This depends on their training and different air carriers and aviation authorities will set different procedures. But that is the angle that investigators went with in this case. They say the pilot felt the plane would be uncontrollable given they didn't know the source of this vibration. So they decided to reject the takeoff as this abnormality only grew as the takeoff progressed. So, what happened next? Well, when you think about it, why does this rule around V1 exist at all? Airport runaways are of finite length. Eventually, you run out of usable runway. The runway at Malaga is 3,200 meters long. But let's take a closer look at where the plane was by the time the decision to abort takeoff was taken. This aircraft required a longer takeoff run. It was a heavy plane. And with a VR of 169 knots, this brought the plane to about here when the pilots began lifting it into the sky. Remember, by this point, the unknown vibration from the nose gear tire was already there. It then got worse as the nose was lifted up. This was the point of maximum nose up pitch. According to the flight data recorder, a little over 2 degrees. This is the region when taking into account reaction times and such, this was the region where the takeoff was aborted, about here. The nose was brought back down and the attempt to decelerate began. As we can see, most of the runway had been exhausted. But why though? Investigators considered the pilot's human performance and his training. They concluded that rejecting the takeoff was perhaps not necessarily the right thing to do, but they were sympathetic towards the captain's decision. When considering all of the information that was known to him at that critical moment, he had to make the call. They concluded that his response was reasonable. Captain Perez, in his pilot training, was primarily taught the takeoff rejection procedures in the context of an engine failure. But the vibration that occurred here had nothing to do with the engines. This exposed a flaw in the captain's pilot training. He was never trained to reject takeoff under anything other than engine failure. This is something that investigators would address in their safety recommendations. So. Having established what went down at this moment, we can now focus on what happened next. The captain tried to slam the brakes and apply reverse thrust. Although, in the process of doing so, his finger slipped and only engines 1 and 2 were brought into reverse. One of the side effects of the captain's execution here was that up until V1, he had his right hand on the throttle controls. 
he would have brought his hand over to the control wheel when lifting the plane into the air. As a consequence of quickly switching his hand position once again, his finger slipped, and engine 3 was not brought into reverse. This manifested with a skew to the left of the runway centerline. Without enough runway to stop the massive plane, a runway overrun was inevitable. So, let's break it down. Flight 995 ran out of room and went onto the grass, overshooting the runway slightly to the left of the centerline. Though the plane was slowing down, it still had a high speed to expend. It crashed into the landing lights before making contact with the ILS equipment, including a small concrete building. But that was only the beginning of the chaos. A major highway exists just beyond this point, known at the time as the Malaga to Torremolinos Highway, now today the MA-21, part of the massive N340 superhighway, it links central Malaga with the other towns on the Costa del Sol. The pilots were not able to stop the plane from reaching the highway. Still over 100 knots, the DC-10 crashed onto the road, destroying a total of three vehicles in the process, which resulted in one non-fatal ground injury. The DC-10 over the following seconds broke apart, crashing into some farming equipment, a billboard, and even another small building. The plane's right wing was torn off during the crash. The massive amount of jet fuel that was loaded into the plane's tanks ignited and the wreckage erupted into flames. Coming to a rest precisely here, just off of the highway. Watching from the control tower, controllers immediately raised the alarm, and emergency services headed out to the crash site, where they arrived within minutes, not before being held up in traffic. The cockpit voice recording was never released. However, there does exist another recording, taken by one of the passengers. American passenger Carlton Maloney happened to have a microphone active during the crisis. He documented, commentated the takeoff process. What you are about to hear is that recording. It has been sourced from an archived collection of news broadcasts compiled by the University of Georgia. It's one thing to have the cockpit voice recording of these old accident flights, but it's something else to have a recording from the cabin. This is rare, especially for a case that is over 40 years old at this point. To my knowledge, it has never before been released here on YouTube. One thing you will notice is how quickly all of this unfolded, the deceleration and the crash. In the recording's final moments, it is a little unsettling, so we have provided a timestamp if this content is something you wish to skip. Okay, still on the ground, running at full speed. We'll have liftoff in about exactly one couple of seconds. Lift off. Lift off. Oop, we got a problem. We got a problem. Yeah, you're slowing down. We got a problem. Ah. We got a problem. We got a problem. Whoop. Whoa. We got a problem. We could not take off. We're on the ground. Whoa. Whoop. We're going to have a crash. When the plane crashed, the electrical systems in the aircraft ceased. Therefore, the pilots and flight attendants could not communicate over the intercom and issue an evacuation order. What happened next was total chaos in the aircraft. Nearly 400 people were still inside this now burning wreckage. The following timeline has been pieced together from the analysis in the accident report and the eyewitness accounts of surviving passengers. Eight passengers in the cabin were killed in the initial crash, thought to be the result of the deformation of the aircraft structure and the immediate fire that erupted inside. Everyone began to scramble towards the aircraft's eight exits, two in the forward, two in the midsection forward of the wing, two exits over the wing, and two exits aft. Each individual exit is numbered one to four, with reference to the left or right. What was immediately apparent when the evacuation began, and something that was noted by a multitude of survivors, was that many passengers, before making their way to the exits, began retrieving their belongings from the overhead compartments, contributing to a staggered evacuation. Speaking to the Associated Press, one passenger reportedly had to climb over the passenger seating. That same passenger who was seated in the final few rows reported seeing one flight attendant heading to the aft two exits, 
doors L4 and R4. This is cross-referenced with additional passenger statements noted in the accident report. In fact, a total of three flight attendants attempted to open these doors, but they couldn't due to how the aircraft structure was misshapen in the accident. Montserrat Al Kalahara, Maria del Pilar Picatostis, and Maria Luisa Burgos valiantly attempted to open these doors but were overcome with smoke. The noted eyewitness who saw this one crew member noted that he saw her become overcome with flames. She was set on fire. The fuselage had ruptured in the rear, allowing an inferno to enter the cabin. I would like to take a moment to thank a viewer for the help in locating the names of these flight attendants. If you look in the comments section of this video, and many videos like this actually, you may find this user, Lost Victims. Also known as at Striker Planes on Twitter, they reached out when I asked for help in locating a passenger manifest. This is what they do. They compile the names of those lost in air disasters, so they are not forgotten. And Spantax 995 was one case they were working on for some time, as not everyone has been accounted for. A complete manifest of all 394 people on board has never been published. So I thank Lost Victims for their contribution to the discussion surrounding this disaster. We can identify here who these people were who risked their lives in this evacuation. In the forward cabin, doors L1, R1, and L2 were opened as soon as the flight attendants could get to them. R2 and L3 were initially left closed due to flames noticed on the outside. In an act of desperation, the doors were opened anyway. Door R3 was left shut. Not all passengers escaped via the doors. As the gangways became overcrowded, others attempted to escape through any opening they could find. Such was the case with one passenger who spoke to the media later that day. Investigators commented that the evacuation was slow. They directly linked it to the fact that many passengers tried to escape with a large amount of hand luggage, contributing to a jam of the gangways. As the passengers and crew spilled into the outside air, a headcount revealed the worst. Dozens were still missing, including those three flight attendants. A total of 50 people didn't make it out of the plane in time. It was determined that they were overwhelmed with the noxious smoke filling the cabin. Though 344 people survived, it came at a cost. Nearly a third of survivors sustained injuries. Spantax 995 could be looked at as a case study in poor aircraft evacuation. This incident occurred in a decade of numerous notable disasters involving aviation fire safety, and much of what has been learned since was not implemented in 1982. To add, two years earlier, Saudi 163 suffered an in-flight fire. A botched evacuation there meant that all 301 people on board perished, even though the plane was on the ground. In total, 50 people lost their lives when they weren't able to escape Spantax 995. <laughs> So I happened to be in Malaga ahead of making this video. I decided to take the opportunity to visit the site of the accident, or at least get as close as I could get. I came to a place called Plaza Mayor, though despite its name, it's not a central plaza in Malaga, it's actually a leisure center with shops, restaurants, and cinemas. It was built somewhat recently, and by that I mean it wasn't there in 1982. But it is almost directly under the flight path of Malaga Airport. So anyway, a short walk from the train station here brings you to this fence, where the landing lights are located for the runway. Malaga Airport today now has two runways, but this was runway 1432, that was present at the time of the accident. Following an evaluation of the airport and the natural shift of the Earth's magnetics, which is a whole physics lesson in and of itself, this is now runway 13 today. And this was the crash site. Well, it's as close as I could get. The plane crashed where the landing lights are, which in this case is technically inside the airport, so it's fenced off. It was just beyond here where the aircraft burst into flames and came to a halt like in those photographs. Believe it or not, 
two planes have actually crashed here in almost exactly the same spot, as 19 years later, Binta Mediterraneo Flight 8261 crashed as a result of dual flameout whilst on final. If you would like to learn more about that curious case, I actually have a video on it. Aside from nearby Plaza Mayor, there really isn't a whole lot here, but I do know this part of Spain fairly well. I've been across that highway myself many times, in fact, so I felt that whilst I had the opportunity to, I should probably come here and visit the place for myself. If anything, this is actually a really good place to do plane spotting. Nearby, there is an IKEA, and of course, I had to pay a visit. The blow high can't get away from me. Let's get back on topic. Let's take the opportunity to examine the aftermath of Flight 995 in a bit more detail. Investigators in Section 3.2 of their official accident report issued a cause statement where they said, The Commission determines the cause of the accident to be the fractional detachment of the retread of the right wheel of the nose gear, originating a strong vibration which could not be identified by the captain leading him into the belief that the aircraft would become uncontrollable in flight, and thus deciding to abandon the takeoff over VR. The decision of aborting takeoff, though not in accordance with standard operating procedures, is, in this case, considered reasonable. On the base of the irregular circumstances that the crew had to face, the short period of time available to take the decision, the lack of training in case of wheel failure, and the absence of takeoff procedures when failure other than that of the engines occurs. External investigators added a little more to the conversation about the cause of the accident. In a 1986 report published by NASA, they highlighted that the simple fact the takeoff was interrupted at a critical phase contributed to the outcome. If the takeoff had continued, then things could have been different if the plane was able to climb away from the airport. In wake of the findings, a number of safety recommendations were issued, including a call to introduce more stringent regulations with regards to the retreading of aircraft landing gear. An evaluation of pilot training in abnormal takeoff procedures was suggested. The investigation highlighted that pilots should be trained in abnormal takeoff events that weren't just related to engine failure. Further safety recommendations were noted with regards to the passenger cabin and evacuation procedures. As the DC-10's passenger cabin was split into three smaller cabins, investigators believed that manufacturers should consider evacuation methods when designing these larger, wide-body airplanes. Better training was also to be given to the flight attendants to help coordinate cabin evacuations. On one final note here, Investigators couldn't help but conclude that the fact that many passengers wasted time and clogged the aisles with their hand luggage contributed to a poor evacuation. As a result of this finding, they called for strict compliance with hand luggage rules. This is something that still comes up in the modern day when you hear of cabin evacuation events. Every so often, video footage will emerge in the media and the discussion about cabin banks is renewed. As has been made evident in the Spantax case, this has long been an issue, and if the flight attendants telling you to leave your stuff behind on every flight wasn't enough, let me finish with this. I know your passport is an important document, but it can be easily replaced. You, watching this video on the other hand, cannot. Hello everyone, thank you so much for watching this video. I know this was a shorter one, but I did try to make this as concise as possible. This was a hard video to make as I'd been working with like zero energy following the surgery I had on January 15th. It's all good though, and I'm feeling much better. I am happy to say that the facial surgery I received was a complete success, and I have been recovering very well. One of the reasons this video seemed to take forever to make was that I had to spend two weeks in Spain so the doctors could observe my progress. If you are curious as to what work was done, I had a chin and jaw plasty, platysmaplasty, and buccal fat removal. I think it affected how I talked a little bit in this video, so apologies for that. I really did my best to uh, make sure I sounded on point. The first results of this surgery I do hope to show you in the next video, actually, and you should expect to see that sometime in March. That's going to be a big one, though, so I'll keep you updated on it.
Anyway, no episode of Disaster Breakdown is complete if I don't take the opportunity to spread appreciation for my patrons over on Patreon for their continuous support to the channel. The names of these lovely people are scrolling on the screen right now, so if you see your name here, a massive thanks to you, and we have a few shoutouts to get through today. In business class, a thank you to Brian Chalo, Kieran Wedlin, and Dan Hepke. In first class, a big thank you to Noah Stekiak and Christopher Rossi. What legends, the whole lot of them, legends. If you, yourself, would like to support the channel further and even have your name featured in this list in the next episode, you can join the Disaster Breakdown Patreon from just £1 per month and the link to that will be in the pinned comment below. All patrons get early access to all new videos at least two days before they go out publicly on YouTube. That is all from me today, I do look forward to sharing the next video with you. Expect one or two posts on the community tab, but if you do want to keep updated where things stand with all of my video ongoings, you should drop me a follow on Twitter or Blue Sky because I'm now on there too. Anyway, thanks for watching, have a great day, and I will see you next time. Goodbye!